Welcome to the Configure It Done podcast. The Configure It Done podcast is a place where successful thought leaders in the SAP space come to share their leadership styles, their tips, and their unique stories on how to run successful large-scale SAP programs. Listen to the podcast to learn from their successes, their failures, their career stories, and their inspirations. This podcast is in partnership with the Black Dog Institute, who aim to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. If you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link below. Okay, as well, if you want to quickly introduce yourself before we uh, before we dive in to the to the market, um, I know Che, you've been with us um, this year. You made a massive impression, but yeah, Che, do you want to give yourself an introduction? Yeah, um, so Che uh, Wolbyoff, uh, SAP recruitment consultant, um, Precision. Um, so joined. Uh, the team in February, um, and yeah, it's been really good so far, so looking forward to the future. <laughs> Tell us a fun fact about yourself, Jay. Uh, fun fact or an interesting fact? I mean, I've, I've really got many fun facts, but I speak Spanish, so that's a bit, a bit of an wow. interesting one. So, <laughs> lived you in would, Spain for a year. You, you would do well at the moment because the tour of Spain is on, the cycling tour, the Vuelta. Ah, yeah. And, uh, that's that's um i mean it's big for the spanish teams so there's a lot of interviews done in spanish and so on so you'd be perfect for listening in on that <laughs> yeah no certainly i'll have a look at that uh, my partner's uh dad he's actually huge into cycling uh, tour de france and he just sits there and watches it on tv it's a bit boring for me uh, it's the same thing <laughs> but he loves it so <laughs> well you speak two more languages than me che. i can't even speak english so uh... <laughs> Oh, good. But um, all right, Chase, so we're going to dive into it. Um, like I said, a quick fire question round. Uh, Chase, you're going to ask the questions to Lisa. Lisa, thank you for coming on uh, the podcast today. Um, but yeah, over to you, Chase, and we're going to get to know get to know a bit about Lisa. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, Lisa, the first one, uh, first question is, is what is your full name? So Lisa Marie Peters. Okay. Uh, what is your nickname? <laughs> well, so I was thinking about this. I had a nickname in year 11 and 12 because I, I went to a, <laughs> another school then for those two years and my nickname was Possum. But for the life of me, I cannot remember how that came about. But that's what I ended up with, Possum, Poss. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's certainly, that's good enough. <laughs> uh, where are you from? So I am from... Uh, the Sutherland Shire in, in Sydney. I was born and bred there. I was born in Caring Bar Hospital and I grew up down the road from there in Engadine. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm basically a Sutherland Shire girl through and through. You'll get on well with our colleague, Abby. She's uh, She lives there as well. Absolutely loves it. I think she moved down a year ago and, um, yeah, she can't speak highly enough of the place. She's trying to get everyone else to move down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how long have you been in Australia? I suppose you, you pretty much just answered that one. Yeah, all my life. <laughs> have, you uh, okay. have you traveled before? Have you traveled before, Lisa? Oh yeah. So um, my family has European origins, and okay. so I spent a lot of time growing up, um, going back to Europe to visit my dad's family. And then I married, um, my husband has, uh, both of his parents are from Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time also going back um, to make sure that our kids could get to, to know their grandparents and so on. So lots of trips to Europe, definitely. Nice. Have you worked abroad as well or just in Australia? Interestingly, I have not worked abroad. Um, there was plenty of opportunities that came out. They they just didn't, from a timing perspective, uh, eventuate. And so I I just spent my uh, spent my career going from pretty much one SAP implementation to the next mm -hmm. um, in Sydney. And the only thing is, can you classify Canberra as being abroad? <laughs> um, because I have spent a lot of time there and I lived there for a while as well doing federal. Yeah. I think most Sydney siders would class it as, as abroad. You do need your passport to get there, don't you? <laughs> mm, sometimes I think so. Yeah. Sorry, Che, I've sabotaged your quick fire question. Oh, no worries. No problem at all. Uh, where are you currently working? 
So I currently look after our government portfolio of work um, from an SAP standpoint. So uh, I am um, spend a lot of my time with New South Wales government um, and federal and then looking at some of the other states as well, Queensland, uh, Victoria, but that's the majority of my time is definitely sp spent with uh, New South Wales government. Cool, okay, perfect. Um, what is the best job you've ever had? Uh, so the best job that I've ever had, um, I think it was when I was working um, in my teenage years for Coles and they had um, this role where someone had to get on the microphone and walk around the store and promote um, various items and there was some promotion on and I remember even not needing to wear the Coles uniform. I could wear essentially some fancy dress with a sash and, and so on um, that uh, and then talk about these different products and sort of talk to customers and things like that. And so that that was excellent. That was right down my alley doing that. Yeah, that's uh, funny you say that. That's quite quite big in the UK, especially where where I live in Wales. Um, they, you know, the in in the supermarkets, we, obviously Asda is a big one for us, and uh, I know they do that that quite a lot. Um, yeah, and on the on the other end of the spectrum, so what what is the worst job that you've ever had? <laughs> I think ultimately it's uh, when you uh, have small children, and the worst job is when you get to deal with the things that come out of them basically <laughs> so um yeah that that was something that i wasn't necessarily prepared for but <laughs> got quite used to basically and even now today it's just one of those things it happens you're used to it you've done it for a while so yeah <laughs> that was the worst job <laughs> you could take note of that one then jay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, your favourite sport? Oh, so that's definitely mountain biking. I mean, pretty much all forms of cycling, though. I I watch um, and velodrome, road, criteriums. I do mountain biking myself. Um, so I love that. But, yeah, very, very much passionate about cycling. Sure, yeah, mountain biking is a pretty cool sport. Uh, favourite beer? Or drink. Oh, so that or drink. would be... I, do you do? <laughs> Yeah, German Weizen beer, um, and that Fantastic. comes from my many trips to Germany and in particular to Munich, mm. to the beer halls there. I, I do like a Weizen beer. You can't be the good Stein beer, you know. <laughs> They're With the a ones. pretzel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly that. Favourite meal? What is your favourite meal? Oh, Thai. I like a good Penang um vegetarian curry um just with lots of good veggies in there and i love that sort of coconutty curry sort of flavor to it so that's if i treat myself on the weekend that's what i go for yeah no that's a that's certainly a good choice i think i love a coconut thai curry myself you can't beat them um number one lockdown tip what what is your tip number one uh pick a call during the day when I least have to participate, when I'm more listening in, and go for a walk and do the call while I'm walking with my dog. That has been my lockdown tip in terms of getting out from being in the one room behind the desk all day and, and just getting out, getting some sunshine, wind, whatever it is. Um, that's what sort of um, helps me anyway, definitely. Yeah, and I suppose that would probably uh, take you on to the next question as well. How, how do you keep yourself sane? <laughs> yeah, definitely lots of dog walking to the point sometimes where my dog looks at me and says, not again. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think it's definitely um, doing, getting out for exercise. Exercise is probably one of the big things for me from an endorphins perspective. And there's dogs outside now. As we speak, he wants to making, walk. making my dog bark. Okay, um, 
but I think the other thing is, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> is that the great thing next door? <laughs> no, and seriously, it's funny you say that. It's two Great Danes that just walk past. Um, <laughs> and, and they're from around the corner. And so my dog knows them. But when he's not outside with them, then he has to bark at them. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, the other thing that keeps me sane is getting a coffee of the of a morning, going to like the place that you know makes my favorite coffee, um, and just enjoying that. Yeah, so that's I I couldn't agree more. Uh, a nice coffee in the morning certainly certainly helps. That's one thing I miss with going to the office. Um, yeah. I Coffee in the morning, walk into the office, sets me up for the day. Um, if you could describe your management style in one word, what, what would it be? Uh, inclusive. Inclusive. Interesting. That's good. Yeah. Favorite, favorite music or film? So my favorite music, and it's what helps me when I have to do a lot of writing. So when I'm helping respond to a proposal to a customer, and I have to really think about, you know, what I'm saying, what I'm writing. And it's Daft Punk, basically. There is something about listening to them um, that just helps me get the creative juicy juices sort of flowing, basically. That's a fantastic choice. I didn't think yeah. you were going to say that. Lisa, <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't agree anymore. <laughs> they are incredible. They are, uh, yeah, what a choice. They, it is. Jay, I think you had a we have a funny story when you thought that Daft Punk were coming to Australia last year, and it was the um, it was the cover cover band. Can you remember that? Yeah, I got done by one of them marketing emails, and oh. um, yeah, I clicked on the link. They say yeah, Daft Punk were coming to Sydney. This is when uh, we were out of lockdown. Oh. Yeah, I clicked on there, and the tickets were like thirty dollars. Uh, I was like, nah, surely thirty dollars to Daft Punk, and it yeah ended up being a tribute tribute act. <laughs> So uh, luckily, luckily, I didn't, luckily, I didn't purchase it. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I nearly did. <laughs> that was the problem. Um, what is your best or favourite holiday destination? Uh, so basically anywhere where I can go mountain biking. Um, I like to go every sort of um, between Christmas and New Year, we go to sort of the Alpine region, New South Wales Alps. So Jindabyne Threadbow, where there's, a lot of really good mountain biking tracks and there's a whole group of us that go. So that's um, a really good holiday for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, that that's, that's it. That's the keys is somewhere where I can go riding. Um, and then the other place I really enjoyed, not that I got to go riding there was Barcelona. Um, we did a bit of a Europe trip in 2018 and I'd never been to Spain and we went to Barcelona and I just thought the city, the architecture, the history, all of that was just amazing. Yeah, no, it's a, it is a beautiful place. Have you, um, have you been to Queenstown mountain biking, Lisa? I haven't. I went there when the kids were small. Um, we took them and, I, and so we didn't have an opportunity to ride. But that's on my list is to go back yeah. to New Zealand and ride over there and not have kids with me um, and just me and my husband and just go riding. Yeah, no, that's uh, you. You'll love it. It's, it's a perfect place. So I lived there um, last year and yeah, I think everyone who even comes or lives in, in the town is either skiing or mountain biking. It's one or the other pretty much. So all love them both. Um, so, yeah, that, that should definitely be on your list. It is superb. You will enjoy it. It's um, definitely my favourite favorite place to go. Yeah, so good. Um, a bucket list thing to do. What's on your, your bucket list? Well, the majority of my bucket list are places to go riding. So uh, the first one is doing the Cape to Cape um mountain bike event in western australia so i was registered to do it in 2020 but unfortunately couldn't go um so the race didn't get uh held in 2020 it's now been moved to october of 21 possibly unlikely i will get there this year uh as well but but you know i'll just hold over to next year basically so WA doing the Cape to Cape uh, and then the other places is um, Derby 
in Tasmania that has really awesome mountain biking. I'd love to get there. Um, and then New Zealand, back to New Zealand and get, get out there riding. That They would be my bucket list places. Oh, there's some good. I, I just jot the derby down so I can take a look into that myself. <laughs> Have a look at derby. Yep. <laughs> I will. Tasmania is definitely on my bucket list. I can assure you that. Um, favorite city? Well, I think, yeah, I think it would be Barcelona in terms of just, I just have such fond memories of, of being there and walking around the streets and, and visiting, um, you know, all of the famous monuments and, uh, what's it called? The Familia Grada, if I've pronounced that correctly, you're Spanish, you're, well, you're not your Spanish, but your Spanish is probably better Sagrada than Sagrada Familia. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's it. Uh, Sagrada. Yeah. Uh, Familia. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's yeah, it's a beautiful city, isn't it? The Sagrada Familia and the, the architecture is um yeah, pretty sublime. <laughs> um, it is. If you weren't working if you weren't working in SAP, um, what would you be doing, do you think? I think I would be a psychologist. I thought you were gonna say cyclist then. <laughs> <laughs> professional cyclist, no. I mean that's a hard gig, a professional cyclist, but no, I would be, I think I would be a, psych a psychologist. I'm fascinated with um, how our mind works and, um, yeah, so I think that, that and I think it's an area that um, I feel if, if uh, I could make a lot of difference in terms of helping people, so that's what I would be. Sure. Great. And, and the last one um, for this round, Lisa, is just a fun fact uh, about yourself. Well, a fun fact is that I can actually hold my, like, not smell anything, like block my nose, but without actually holding it, right? And that is, is not everyone can do it, um, but it did help me with my worst job in the world, right? Which was when <laughs> my kids would do things, you know, that I didn't necessarily want to smell, okay? <laughs> So that's my fun fact. <laughs> Absolutely a talent. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're, we're going to get into the um, the crux of it now. At least when we spoke yeah. last week, I think I uh, I mentioned I was speaking to um, Peter Gilmer. He was on the, the podcast last Friday as well. And um, when I mentioned we're doing this podcast with yourself, he had nothing but good words to say about you and your knowledge around the system um, and it really did resonate with him all those you know years ago when he was um, you know crossed paths. So um, yeah, for someone to say that after you know not being in contact, that's that really kind of resonate with me as well. So I'm looking forward to tapping into your um, your insights, your project management philosophy. But before we go into that, if you can give us a short overview um, of your your story or your your career, um, so we can get to know you a bit more. Yeah, so I did a computer science degree and then after finishing that I went um, with a consulting company and I was a programmer. So I did what was called RPG programming for the AS400 um, IBM mid-range mainframe. And uh, because the mid-range was used a lot by manufacturing and distribution companies as kind of their ERP system. I spent a couple of years going in and out of um, companies like Coca-Cola and some of the different pharmaceutical companies doing writing programs, essentially. Um, I quickly realised I wasn't cut out to be a programmer, you know, for a long, long time. I really wanted to be more you know, gathering requirements and um, getting more in the architecture space and designing systems and so on. So I um, interviewed for a job with what was then Anderson Consulting and I got uh, hired straight into their product um, group because of my manufacturing and distribution background. And uh, I straight away went on to... Um, a SAP implementation for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and I basically um, learned about SAP. We were implementing SAP then, um, and that was really the start of my career. So that's 26 years ago, uh, and I pretty much have done back-to-back -back SAP implementations, just 
gone from one to another um, and spent, you know, uh, probably the, the first 10, 15 years of my career in products, manufacturing distribution companies, and then moved into public sector, looking at more the um, what we call the back office processes, so HR, procurement, finance. So that was sort of how I basically got into SAP. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a bit of a curveball um, at you now, Lisa. You you are a commodity in the in the SAP market. You're a, a woman in tech who's an architect that's got a considerable amount of of knowledge. And diversity is a huge huge topic um, in the in the market um, at, at the moment. So I'd love to get your your view your view on that. Um, and I, I remember you said before in the quickfire question round, your your you know your leadership style is very like inclusive, for instance. So yeah. I just I just want to like touch on that, get your view, um, because when we done um, a survey, um, the the SAP market typical person is a middle aged bald white man. That that <laughs> is literally what the market is. I think it was eighty four percent was uh, was male. So we're in a very very male dominated market. So yeah, I'd love to get your your view on. Being that commodity in the in the market, a woman in in tech, and and get your view on on that yeah you know, diversity topic. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, for me, it's about creating that safe environment for inclusion and diversity on projects and pieces of work that we do, and and so that's kind of a big part of what I do when I'm when I'm building teams to deliver SAP projects is looking at how we can have that very diverse range you know of people um, working together <clears throat> and I think you know that that creating that safe environment that everyone feels valued and can contribute um, and that their <clears throat> point of view and their experience counts um, is what definitely helps for 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 females and males you know to really thrive um in what they're doing and and we know that when people feel connected to what they're doing um you know and have that sense of purpose that they're at their best so so that's sort of you know i guess my philosophy in terms of how i go back go about doing my work but i think specifically from a a, a in terms of females in technology, it's also about creating, you know, being a role model and and creating uh, that environment for, for females to also thrive in. Um, and it's what helped me in my career is that I there were other female role models for me that helped me thrive. So that's, you know, then that sort of pay it forward in terms of what I'm doing to then in turn help other females thrive um, because it, it, I think it just comes down to confidence and feeling comfortable in the, the environment and feeling valued. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I think is the key to creating that inclusive and diverse um, environment to work in. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you for that, Lisa, and sharing that, that insight. Uh, people like yourself, and you're right, you're, you're a role model in in the industry and um yeah the more people that can see you kind of succeed it might inspire younger the next generation to to come through as well because we have got a talent shortage in this in this country and we really do need to nurture our next generation and make sure they're in they're in safe hands basically but um i've got to throw another question at you what what keeps you in the in the sap domain obviously you've been with ascension now for a long long time and what what keeps you there and what keeps you in the mm. sap domain I think uh, it's definitely uh, the variety of, of work um, that you get to do when you're using the SAP solution and implementing it. Um, it's just gone from being, you know, mainly sort of in the ERP space and particularly its origins around manufacturing, distribution, resources, those sorts of companies into being, you know, into, you know, the public sector and not just the back office processes, but also starting to, to sort of be in some of the front office type areas um, as well. So it's just that variety because I love being challenged. I love learning and growing. Mm -hmm. And the SAP solution set itself has evolved so much over time. 
um, that it just keeps me wanting to learn more and, you know, get experienced at implementing the new solutions, uh, particularly now with the move to cloud, those sorts of things. I, that's that's what it's all about for me, learning, growing, being challenged. Yeah. And when we had um, Nick Zafiris on the podcast, I think it was on the second second podcast, he made a good point about um, you know SAP. He said the rules don't change, but obviously it continues to evolve. Um, and he, he linked it to um, golf. I think Phil Mickelson won a major at the time, and he said the rules of golf don't change, but like the athletes evolve through time. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, yeah, it's good what you're saying there. Um, all right, I'm going to tap into your. Um, your approach on a project and I'd, I'd love to understand what a successful SAP program is is for you and in addition to that um, Lisa how has your view changed over over time? So a successful SAP project essentially needs to be about the vision of how um, the business you know is going to change and transform and and evolve right and, and in a way i know this sounds a little bit strange it shouldn't necessarily be all about sap like the mm -hmm. technology it should be about what about the vision of of how that business is going to transform what it's going to enable them to do um so that's what successful looks like to me is if the vision statement is about you know helping you know um say the government be able to put more services um into the community to put you know more police um more nurses more teachers um that's you know um and and effectively use their resources um that that's the vision for me for for an sap implementation and then it's really about well how does the technology of sap enable that what what does it help them do differently plan better you know make decisions better get better visibility you know of their workforce their finances so that's you know i think what success looks like um in terms of how has it changed I think um, the big part that's changed is the user experience. You know, when I first started implementing SAP, um, from a user experience perspective, you got what you got and you didn't complain as an end user. <laughs> well, you could, but basically it was what it was, right? Now there's the user experience that um, piece is so important, whether you're um, – an employee using SAP or whether you're a, 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 um, a citizen or a customer, um, basically, you know, what is that experience and how do you get delight from that experience just as you get from using the apps on your phone? The experience should be equivalent um, yeah. to the delight you get from those. So I think that's the huge bit that's changed for me is the focus on the experience. Sure. And is that, um, do you see that as, like, do you see projects as a lot harder and more challenging now because of that user experience or or not? I think it's just different. Mm. You know, I think there are elements of projects that have become simpler because the architecture and so on has changed to make, you know, projects simpler. Um, but there is an element of the user experience that adds that layer in that you've got to get to the heart of it, you've got to understand it, and you've got to figure out how you're delivering on that experience. Yeah. That's the element that has to be included. And it's and it's not just the experience of the technology, it's the experience of, you know, are people, do people have the skills? Are they trained? Do they understand what they're doing to be able to use the technology? So it's very holistic, the experience side. And mm -hmm. so that's where some of the complexity comes because how do you make sure from a project standpoint you're bringing together all of the people that understand how to deliver on a good experience? Sure, sure. Okay. All right, Che, um, over to you. I know you've got the, the next stage of, uh, of yeah. questions here for Lisa. This is brilliant, by the way, Lisa. Thank you for this. Yeah, no, that, that was 
great insight obviously with with yourself having a big focus on on government and and as you mentioned earlier obviously that that certainly has a huge impact on the community as well so yeah that's that certainly is a great um insight um what are the the top three imperatives um lisa that you you look for um within your team when when delivering a project so um it's definitely you know um building a team that is inclusive um, and where everyone feels valued in terms of their different skill sets and experience that they're bringing the, to the table. So definitely um, inclusion and then the diversity, you know, recognising that there is a such a diverse range of skills that need to come together to deliver on a project. Um, there are people that have really detailed technical skills that need to be able to program. There are neat people who need to be able to, you know, look at things from a business process standpoint and articulate a new business process to the, a customer and, and be able to talk in that sort of language. So a lot of different skills that need to come together. Um, and then the other thing would be um, having the imperative of having a really co collaborative um, environment to work in. And that's not to say that there won't be times of challenge and disagreement, um, but building an environment where that that can be done in a manner um, that essentially, you know, moves us forward rather than moves us back. So um, I think that's, you know, making it safe and collaborative to where for, for people to feel that they can say what they need to say, ask questions, you know, so that we can share ideas and sort of, you know, discuss things when we're not on the same page, for example. Yeah. So they would be my imperatives. We had a um, we had a new starter um, start three weeks ago in our organisation, um, Lisa, and one of the one of the tasks that we got her to do as part of that um, inclusion, inclusion and, and collaboration is she had to call um, each each member of the team to understand their role, um, understand um, what part they you know played in the in the business, and um, basically find out more um, about them. Anyway, we asked for feedback, um, which we continually do, and one of the feedback points she mentioned was that was actually quite challenging for her to ha have her have that accountability to reach out to people mm. in the team. Some are very busy. Um, you know, some are you know, more senior, for instance, it was actually quite um, quite challenging for her. So based on that feedback, we flipped it and now the team have to call a new starter them, themselves. Wow. So do, do you have any um, insights as to how you make people feel included or um, yeah, how you collaborate? Any like small tips that any, you know, program manager or project manager listening can say, do you know what, I can implement that into, into our day job? Yeah, I think I think it's getting to know people, um, you know, and and I think you know I try to do it in a one-on-one -on -one way, in that I connect to people within you know the team mm -hmm. individually and get to know a bit about their story, mm. you know, who are they, what floats their boat. You know, what do they do outside of work? What have they got going on for them? Like their family, whatever it is, right? Because I think when you can connect to people and you know a bit more about their story, um, there just becomes that energetic connection to them, you know. And, and so I think that's a big tip for me is look beyond the conversations about, you know, how are you going with this, this particular design? Is it is it ready? Is it due? How do you go in that workshop? But, but you know, how are you coping with, you know, being in a local government area where you're locked down or whatever it is, right? What do you do to keep yourself sane? Just, just having those little conversations, I think, build camaraderie that's beyond... Um, you know, just the work. So that's the key for me. And then I think it's just doing some fun things. You know, uh, we were doing in the last project on a Friday, our daily stand-ups, we would have a theme for them. 
and someone would pick the theme and we had to wear a t-shirt or have a background or something that matched the theme, like your favourite movie, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then everyone on the call got time to explain what it was um, that they that they had picked for that call. Yeah. Um, and so you got to see this other side of people. Oh, you're into Star Wars or whatever it is. <laughs> right? So the next time you get on a call, you can kind of like talk about a few things to do with it. Um, so I, I think having fun is the other part. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's always the small things that have a massive impact. And, yeah. Uh, it, it can Same, be easy. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Same thank you. Or well done. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Same thank you. Um, goes miles, you know, uh, definitely. So, yeah, that, that, that's a big one as well. Brilliant. I think. I think those things are, like you mentioned, obviously doing fun things is very relatable, obviously, especially now um, in the current situation that we're at the yeah, moment, getting to know exactly. someone is even more important, isn't it? Yeah, um, definitely. Okay, um, perfect. So we, we touched earlier on um, project management methodologies. Uh, I think Jay, Jay mentioned that and um, really keen to just understand what your project management me methodology is, Lisa, and you know, can you can you define what that me methodology is? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the best way to describe it is layered. And what I mean by that is I like to have the first layer being like the plan on a page, right? You know, if we could lay out what the next year is looking like on a page so that everyone sort of gets to see the blocks on the chart you know, we're going to do this release from here to here or this design activity from here to here and the outcome is going to be this. You know, so uh, it provides an anchor that everyone can kind of see it, ask questions, oh, my bit fits in here, I understand how I fit in and so on, I understand the dependency. So I think that's kind of the first layer for me is get that plan on a page and then the next layer is having the detail that sits underneath it because you really need to be able to execute to a plan and not just make it up as you go. So, so having that next layer down of detail and having individual accountabilities, you know, so people know that's my part of the plan that I'm delivering on. I need to be able to talk to that, report my status against it, um, and then having those metrics in place to actually be able to figure out whether you're on track, you know, um, am I far enough progressed in this part of my plan compared to, you know, from an actual perspective compared to where I thought I was going to be, I planned to be. And I think the tricky bit about the metrics is in particular in a lot of the work I do, which is more in the architecture and design spaces, what is the metric because it's quite a qualitative activity right um whereas when you're into say build and test you, you start to get i've got 100 things to build i've got 500 scripts to execute testing so it can be quite definitive your your count of what you're tracking towards whereas the, that design architecture piece is quite challenging because you know, how do I know when the design and architecture is done, right? It, it, a lot of it is to do with um, the inputs from the customer and, you know, getting their endorsement that, you know, the design is is matching their expectation, their requirements and those sorts of things. So I think that's where the tricky part lies. And a lot of it is about communication and, and, and eliciting that from the customer. So, um, so yeah, I think that would be my, my approach is multiple layers um, to work through. Sure. No, that's, that's great. Obviously, planning, having visible <laughs> visibility on that and what, what it yeah. actually looks like as well. Okay, perfect. Um, and the, what would you um, describe, Lisa, as, as your biggest failure um, and, and what did you learn from it? It's always an interesting one. <laughs> so my biggest failure is pro it, it's before I sort of um, started my career. It actually goes back to when I started university. And, and I was saying I did a computing science degree. Um, and the first um, set of subjects that I had to do, there was a big subject on programming. 
and we had to learn actually Pascal programming back then. But it was a big unit and it was like six months long and I had never programmed before. I hadn't done it as part of my HSC. Um, so it was new to me, possibly like learning another language, but I found it really, really difficult. And I think the challenge I had was I really let it get to me, like get to my head, right? And, and what I mean by that is um, the biggest component of passing that subject was an actual practical exam where they gave you a set of requirements. You had to develop a program and then you had to submit it. And we had to go into the university computer labs on a sat day to do it. And I remember I went in and the first thing I did was I forgot my password to actually log on to do the exam. And by the time they re reset my, because I was in such a flap because I was so worried about, you know, whether I was going to be able to do it. And by the time they reset my password, um, I was gone, right? Like I couldn't think properly. I really didn't, wasn't able to, to deliver on, you know, what, what I needed to do. And I ended up failing that subject. And then I had to repeat it the next six months. So that was my biggest learning was sort of to kind of take stock of, of those emotions that get to us, that kind of, you know, essentially hijack us. Um, and take us away and, and and be able to really, you know, think, be calm in those situations. And the next time I had to do that exam, six months later, I was so much better prepared mentally in terms of it, if those little thoughts started to get into my mind that I was going to fail or whatever it was, that I was ready, that I'd already sort of dealt with them, you know. So that was the kind of confidence piece. So that was my biggest failure. A lot I learned out of that. I've always said failures is, is your biggest asset, definitely. Yeah. Um, only if you learn from them, I suppose. But um, yeah. yeah, it's a great example. Great yeah. example there. Yeah. Or, All right. or, or basically figure out a password you won't forget. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's probably the other key. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brilliant. So uh, yeah, we're coming towards the end of the, the podcast. Um, Lisa, it's been brilliant to understand your methodology and your imperatives and uh, obviously uh, what you've learned from uh, your failure there. Um, what I'd love to tap into is who's been your your biggest influence on your career and, and what did they teach you? Yeah, so I think for me, it's kind of been um, different parts of my career. I had different people who made an impact. And so the first part of my career with, with Accenture, it was really those people who took the time to mentor and coach me in my junior years um, because I still remember them. I still remember how kind they were to take the time to guide someone um, and, and show them the ropes and those sorts of things. So that, that was sort of the early part. Then there was the part of my career when I was going off on maternity leave and those people who kept me connected to the organisation while I did that um, and prepared me for when I came back from maternity leave, um, you know, and, and were sort of able to share with me their stories of having done that as well um, and create an environment where I could then um, come back, work part-time, you know, those sorts of different aspects that really made a big difference for me. Then there was the people who really coached me and guided me um, in terms of uh, promote, getting my promotion to managing director, because that's a big thing from an Accenture standpoint. Um, and so there was a lot of people who, who really devoted time to help me, um, you know, map out my path to get to managing director. And now um, it is a whole, um, I guess, myriad of people from uh, more senior leaders in the organisation who I really, um, you know, look at in terms of role models. So Julie Sweet, our CEO, for example, um, and then people who um, 
are new to the organisation or people who are in my teams that just come in with lots of fresh ideas. Um, I think they're a big influence on me because I like to hear what they have to say and I like to take um, what what I think um, for me works for me and resonates for me and evolve because that's what it's all about, constantly being able to evolve. So I like the fact that there's just all these different people that I can learn from. Brilliant. So you're sitting here as a yeah, managing director of Accenture. It's obviously a huge, huge thing. And congratulations on that. Um, if you had to look back at your 21 year old self, um, what what advice would you give a, a younger Lisa? Be kind to yourself. Um, be compassionate. Have forgiveness. Um, and you know, really. Um, sort of think about how you're evolving and also um, it's how you choose to respond. So being conscious of how you choose, right, because you have a choice, right, um, and and that's, I think, um, very important. Brilliant. Lisa, that was fantastic. Thank you for your, your time today. Um, I'm sure Che appreciates it as, as well. That was uh, brilliant. Uh, before we let you go, um, obviously we're continuing on this this podcast series. Is there anyone that you would like to um, listen to in particular? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of people who have interesting stories. Um, so uh, Sarah Kruger, who's our HR lead for ANZ, um, she she is um, very inspiring in terms of her career and um, and you know, really leading our organisation in the face of a lot of change. We've had a big organisational change, which we call the group new growth model, and then also leading an organisation that's gone through, um, you know, the times that we're in at the moment with the pa pandemic and so on. Um, so I think being a, a HR leader um, is is really uh, interesting um time and I'm I'm sure Sarah has many lovely insights to share uh, and then the other person is Charlotte Curtis who's another managing director in our SAP business group mm -hmm. um, you know she's got an amazing um, sort of SAP implementation experience um, uh, you know similar background to me from an SAP standpoint but a whole range of different clients that she's worked with and she's been from overseas and in Australia and she's got a young family and she's just um, a lovely person to to talk to and work with. So I think they're my two picks basically. Yeah, we've met Jay and I've met Charlotte and you can see how you know, warm she is and her, her philosophy comes through, her leadership yeah. philosophy comes through and um, I know she's kind of getting to grips with the the new kind of social element to it as well and she's you know at the forefront of that she's posting daily and um, yeah. so yeah definitely be a good person to um to speak to so brilliant thank you for that thank you for your time today lisa i really appreciate it cool Thanks so much.